God's plans are sovereign. They are unpredictable because God knows the end from the beginning. It was entirely God's. The decision was made without respect to birth order, and the decision was made without respect to character. And I, I realize that there probably isn't a more divisive or, or at least uncomfortable doctrine in all of Christianity than the doctrine of election. heads for a moment of prayer. Oh, Father, as we come to your word, we confess to you how desperately we need your word. And so we ask, Lord, that you would meet us where we are, that you would instruct us with your word, that you would Confront us, if necessary, with your word, and correct us with your word. But we pray, Lord, that by the power of your Spirit, you would grant us understanding, that we may be more edified, and that Christ may be more glorified in our lives. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Well, if you have your Bible with you, turn to Genesis chapter 25. Genesis chapter 25. We're about halfway through the book of Genesis, more or less. We're roughly halfway through, and so maybe it's no surprise that, you know, if you were to liken the book of Genesis to, to the ocean, you would think the deepest part of the ocean would be right in the middle. And the depths that we're going to reach today are pretty incredible. We're going to reach some, some profound theological depths as we continue in our study of Genesis today. Last week, we left off with Abraham's death. We saw that Abraham lived for 175 years and that his sons, uh, that, that Isaac and Ishmael came together and buried him next to Sarah. And you know, whenever a great person or whenever a, a, a very, very influential person dies, there's always concern about who's going to carry the torch in that person's place. I was reading an article about this type of thing happening in the corporate environment in the world, and it said, quote, the ripple effects of a founder's death can linger for a surprisingly long time. Companies at which a founding chief executive dies are statistically more likely to go out of business than otherwise similar ventures, and they typically experience a sharp sales drop and a moderate decrease in employment, according to research by two economists, end quote. And that is often the way that things work in the world. Somebody dies and the company dies with that person, or you know, it, it becomes less than. But that is not the way that things work in God's kingdom. Thankfully, praise the Lord for that. We've seen what's happened with Abraham. Abraham was known as the father of the faith. We saw that God called Abraham at a time when nobody on the face of the earth was worshiping or seeking or serving God. Abraham was a pagan. He was worshiping a moon god, but God called him. And while Abraham was a key figure in the story of God's glory being revealed through the unfolding of his perfect plans and purposes, God didn't need Abraham. God didn't need, Abraham was a key figure, but God did not need Abraham to stick around for God's plans to continue unfolding through history. God's plans included Abraham, but he didn't need Abraham. God called Abraham, he led Abraham, he blessed Abraham, he made great promises to Abraham and to his offspring, but God did not need Abraham. Last week we saw that Abraham died at 175 years of age. And Isaac and Ishmael, they came together, they buried their father. And we saw the faithfulness of God to the promises that he had made to Abraham. And that's a, that's a, that's a, a, a theme that we're going to see continuing well after Abraham is gone as well. God had promised to make a multitude of nations through Abraham. And we saw that he had several additional sons with Keturah, after Sarah's death. We saw that despite the, the existence or the, the birth of these other sons, Abraham gave his entire estate 
to Isaac, which was a reflection of Abraham's continued belief, his, his continued faith in what God had promised in the covenant. God himself had promised that Isaac would be the one, that Isaac was the son of the covenant promise who would inherit the promises of the covenant. And then we saw this in chapter 25, verse 11. It said, after the death of Abraham, God blessed Isaac, his son, and Isaac settled at Beer Lahai Roy. And when you read that, it's supposed to give you this, this great sense of anticipation of what's to come. This is supposed to give us a, a great expectation of what's going to continue happening through Isaac as God's purposes continue to unfold. Now, if you and I were going to write this story, if, if, if we were, you know, just, if, if all we had was what's led us to this point, we might figure that, that Isaac would be this, this great a uh, godly leader who was just strong and mighty and who had a multitude of children with his wife, Rebecca. But part of the theme of this story as we move forward is nicely summed up by what Paul once wrote to the Corinthians. He said this, he said, the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers, not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. That's what he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 25 to 29. And if we were writing this story, according to our own wisdom, according to man's fallen wisdom, we'd say, well, if we want this plan to work, if we want this all to unfold, we need to select the best. We need to select the brightest. We need to select the strongest and the most superior men we can find. I mean, isn't that how it works when you put together a football team or a baseball team or any kind of sports team? You want the biggest and the best and the brightest. Isn't that how it works when you put a company together? You want all-star executives, people who have a resume that looks like it should be enshrined in gold. Isn't that how it works when you put a military together, an army together? You want the biggest, the brightest, the most courageous. Isn't that how it works when you put together a team of engineers? You want your best and brightest on the front lines. Of course, that is how it works in the corporate world. But that is not how God works. That is not how God works. Today we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 25, verses 12 to 26. And the main point of this portion of Scripture is that God chooses the meek, the lowly, and the unlikely. So that when His plans do unfold, He alone gets all of the glory. He's not just deserving of 99.99% of the glory. He's deserving of all the glory. And so God chooses the meek and the lowly and the unlikely so that when his plans unfold, he gets all the glory. So we start out by remembering that we were just told of the way that God blessed Isaac, but we start out actually looking at the way that Ishmael prospers. Let's look at verses 12 to 18. It says, these are the generations of Ishmael. Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's servant, bore to Abraham. These are the names of the sons of Ishmael, named in the order of their birth. Nebaioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kedar, Ab Adbil, Mibsam, Mishma, Duma, Masa, Hadad, Tema, Jetur, Nafish, and Kedema. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names, by their villages and by their encampments, twelve princes according to their tribes. These are the years of the life of Ishmael. 137 years he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They settled from Havilah to Shur, which is opposite Egypt in the direction of Assyria. He settled over against all his kinsmen. Now once again, it's tempting to skip over all these names because they're so hard to pronounce, but these names are very important. They represent two things, ultimately. First, they remind us of God's faithfulness to His promises. 
You'll remember when Isaac was born and Ishmael laughed and mocked Isaac that he had to be sent away, that, that Sarah instructed, him to send, uh, instructed Abraham to send Ishmael away, and God confirmed what Sarah had said. And Abraham's prayer was, let him live before my face. Let, let, me, let me see him grow up. And this is God's response back in chapter 17, verse 20. He makes a, a different promise to Abraham. He said, you can't, you're not going to watch him grow up. But he says, as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I will Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and multiply him greatly. He shall father 12 princes and I will make him into a great nation. There you go. He shall father 12 princes and I'm going to make him into a great nation. And sure enough, we see that 12 princes, 12 male offspring are born to Ishmael. There are a total of 12 princes and these 12 sons became the rulers of 12 tribes of people who would settle in the region of northern Arabia. These sons would become very influential people. They were very powerful people. And several of their names you can find scattered throughout Scripture. But the first point that we see here, the first reason that we have all these things named, is to show us that God was faithful to what he had promised Abraham. Ishmael prospered and he was the father of 12 sons, 12 princes. The second thing that this teaches us is of the way that God's plans unfold. We might think that Isaac would be the one to have all these kids and that Ishmael would suffer from barrenness. But what, it, what this teaches us is that God's plans don't always unfold according to the wisdom of man. We'd say, hey, you know, Ishmael was Abraham's first son. He, you know, he, he's, he's got 12 powerful sons. This is the way to make God's plans unfold. This is the way to bring God's plans to fruition by the birth of powerful and influential people who will take over the region. But this reminds us that God's ways aren't our ways, that his thoughts aren't our thoughts. His foolishness, as Paul says, his foolishness is greater than our wisdom, and his weakness is greater than our strength. And you might say, wait a minute, God doesn't have any foolishness, and God doesn't have any weakness. Exactly. That's exactly what Paul's trying to say. That's the point. That's why Paul articulates God's unfathomable wisdom and unreachable power in this way. We see that Ishmael prospers according to the promises that God had made to Abraham. So what about Isaac? I mean, we, first we read that God blessed Isaac. Then we read that Ishmael has, has done really well. So we might be expecting that Isaac would be just king of the world. I mean, if he's the one to inherit the promises of the covenant, and if God is blessing him, you're, you're probably expecting him to have a lot of very powerful sons. But instead, we see just the opposite. We see that Rebekah was barren. And she was barren for 20 years. Let's look at verses 19 to the first part of verse 21. It says, These are the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham fathered Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren. Sounds familiar? Because Sarah faced the same predicament. Barren. There are these covenant promises, but Sarah was barren, and now it's the same with Rebecca. Covenant promises, and Rebecca is barren. Reminds us that God's plans are sovereign. God's plans are sovereign. They are unpredictable because God knows the end from the beginning. He doesn't just look down the corridor of time so that he knows the end from the beginning. How does he know all things? Because he has decreed all things. He has ordained all things. He's either caused or allowed all things to come to pass. He does all things, not most things, not some things. He does all things according to the counsel of his own sovereign will, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11. The few clear glimpses we get of Isaac is that he was a very 
faithful person, but he was also a very passive person. Really, the most we know about him at this point is what happened up on Mount Moriah when Abraham brought him up there and he didn't try to escape being sacrificed as a burnt offering for the Lord. He was passive. He went along with it. He was faithful. He, he agreed to do it. He didn't resist. But contrast that. Contrast this passive person that Isaac is with what we know about Rebecca, who freely volunteered to spend somewhere in the neighborhood of two very hot and sweaty hours watering the camels of Abraham's servant who had gone to find Isaac a wife. It would be good to remember back to that passage, good to remember the blessing that her family sang over her as she left to marry Isaac. Back in chapter 24, verse 60, they sang this. They sang, our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands, and may your offspring possess the gate of those who hate them. There are some high expectations in that prayer. I mean, given what they knew about Abraham's calling and the promises, the covenant promises that God had made to Abraham, that his, his offspring would be as numerous, as uncountable as the stars in the sky or the sand on the beach. I'm sure that Rebecca and her family both had very high expectations of what was to come. Very high expectations for lots and lots and lots of kids. But that's not what happened. That's not the way God designed this whole thing to play out. And so once again, you might be thinking, well, what's going on here? I mean, if God's going to make a great nation you know, of Abraham through Isaac, Isaac's going to need to have some children here. And so we're reminded once again of the fact that God doesn't need anyone for anything. And that the blessings of the covenant will not, indeed they cannot, be received or accomplished by human effort or will. If they had just gone off and, and had tons of kids, they would have said, okay, this is the way it's supposed to be. And God would have gotten some glory, but he wouldn't have gotten all the glory. Because it would have just been seen as nature taking its course. The promises of the covenant cannot be received or accomplished by human effort or will, or in our timing. But we do see some good in Isaac. We see, we, we see some, some good virtue here, some godly virtue, because rather than taking matters into his own hands, which you'll remember was Abraham's tendency, whenever things didn't go according to, to what he thought God was going to do, he would take matters into his own hands. When there's a famine, he goes down, you know, he, he, he goes down to Egypt and he lies about who his wife is. When he is barren, his wife says, well, why don't you take my servant and try having a child with her? But Isaac doesn't do that. He doesn't take matters into his own hands the way that his father did. Instead, he goes to the Lord in prayer. And that's just a, a quick, a, a brief glimpse of a deep, deep faith, a strong faith that's been built up in Isaac. It reveals to us that Isaac believed the promises of God with all of his heart, all of his soul, all of his mind, all of his strength. He believed in God's promises. And so when things didn't go according to the way he had envisioned them, instead of trying to take matters into his own hands and thinking, well, God must be waiting for me to do something, he goes to the Lord. He trusted. He, he had faith that God would do what God had promised to do. We don't get any indication, by the way, of how he felt about this, really. We don't get any, any glimpses of Isaac's thoughts or his feelings on having a, a prolonged delay. And I, you know, I, I would have to imagine that he was frustrated. I, I would have to imagine that he was confused. I would have to imagine that he was at least tempted to question God. I mean, isn't that, isn't that what every one of us does? Aren't, aren't we all faced with these temptations when God doesn't do what we think God should do when we think God should do it? Don't we face those same temptations? But there's no indication that Isaac did. If the temptation was there, there's no indication that he sinned by questioning God. Maybe he had peace just knowing that God had made the promise and that God was faithful. 
He'd seen it in his father. So maybe he learned some valuable lessons. Maybe he learned vicariously through the lessons of his father about waiting on God. We don't know what he thought. We don't know exactly what he felt. But instead of taking matters into his own hands, what we do know is that he went to God. He prayed. And that is one mark of a very profound, a very mature, a very deep faith. Now verse 20 shows us that Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah. And verse 26 is going to tell us that he was 60 years old when that prayer was answered. So 20 years of barrenness. 20 years of waiting. You've got to wonder, how many of those years did Isaac pray? And the indication seems to be that he prayed for all 20 years. That's some persistence. Can you pray for something for 20 years? I honestly don't know if I can. It would be the grace of God that would drive me. That's the only thing. In, 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 my, in my own weakness, my own fallen understanding, I, I don't know if I could pray for 20 years, but he prays for 20 years. Isaac is a man of deep, deep faith. And after 20 years, the prayer was finally answered. Let's continue with the second part of verse 21 through 26. Starting at the beginning of 21, it says, And Isaac prayed to the Lord for his wife because she was barren, and the Lord granted his prayer. And Rebekah, his wife, conceived. The children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is thus, why is this happening to me? She went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. When her days to give birth were completed, behold, there were twins in her womb. The first came out red, all his body like a hairy cloak, so they called his name Esau. Afterward, his brother came out with his hand holding Esau's heel, so his name was called Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when she bore them. What must have been going through Rebecca's mind when these two children in her womb started kicking. That's one of the most beautiful moments in, in parenthood, is when you first start feeling your child moving around in the womb. But apparently for her, it felt like there was a war taking place inside of her. She and Isaac had patiently waited with great anticipation for 20 years for their prayers to be answered, and when their prayers were answered, I am positive that they didn't expect anything remotely like this. They didn't expect her womb to feel like the Tasmanian devil was in there. The first thing that we're supposed to see here is that God was the one who was sovereign over Rebecca's womb. And that when her barrenness did come to an end, it was only because God intervened. It was because God stepped in, and God is the one who made it happen which reminds us and which tells us and which is a picture of the fact that God was completely sovereign over the entire situation. The only way that the covenant promises were going to be passed on to Isaac's offspring was if God made it happen. And it seems likely, probable, that God wanted to make sure that they and make sure that we understood that this is why there was a 20-year delay. It was to remind us, to demonstrate for us crystal clear that God was the one who was sovereign over this. And I'm sure there had to be just immense great joy when Isaac and Rebekah learned that she was finally with child. But we see immediately that their delight turned to dismay as Rebekah felt the two boys within her going to battle in the womb. Literally translated, the Hebrew gives us a very graphic image of what she was feeling. Literally translated, it says, the children smashed themselves inside of her. It's no wonder then that she was alarmed. But what did she do when she gets alarmed? Like Isaac. She goes to the Lord. She seeks answers from the Lord. She prays to the Lord. She takes her cares and she casts them upon the Lord. Such wisdom and such 
profound faith. And the answer that she receives from the Lord is of cosmic, enormous significance. She learns that she has twins and that each of these twins would go on to become a nation. There would be nations that opposed each other. There would be nations that despised one another. But she also learned that the conventional rules of the the culture didn't apply, held no power in terms of what God had planned out. Rather than the younger serving the older, which is the way conventional wisdom would have it, in the case of her children, in the case of Jacob and Esau, the older would serve the younger. The older would serve the younger. And that's why Esau being the older, Jacob being the younger, you would say normally in that culture you would say Esau and Jacob, but the Bible says Jacob and Esau when it refers to them together. Now this is a really interesting predicament. Why did Isaac and Rebekah want a child? Or why did they need a child? For the sake of carrying on the covenant promises of God, But what are you going to do when you have twins? Who gets to carry on the covenant promises of God when they're conceived and born virtually at the same time? Now, by man's wisdom, by man's cultural convention, we would say the older, or maybe you'd say, well, why don't we just wait and see? Why don't we wait and see what kind of men these turn out to be? Well, one turns out to be a very manly man who is strong, who is courageous, who is fierce, who is a warrior, and the other turns out to be a swindler. Who gets to carry the promises? In fact, their names actually reflect their character. Esau means hairy, and Jacob basically means he cheats. So who determines who will receive the covenant promises of God. God does. God determines it. God makes the choice. God is the one who decides. God is the one who determined that the older would serve the younger. God is the one who had decreed from eternity that it would be the descendants of Jacob who would later on be renamed Israel, who would have the covenant promises, and who therefore would go in to conquer the promised land. These are the people that Moses is writing to. God is the one who determined who would receive the covenant promises. Everybody with me so far? Does this make sense so far? Because this is the launching pad that's going to take us into the, the highest heights of the theological atmosphere. God is the one who determined who would receive the covenant promises. And all of this demonstrates two primary principles for us. First of all, it demonstrates, it's a, it's a picture of the fact, it's an illustration that God's choice is often contrary to man's ways of thinking and choosing. Rather than choosing for the covenant promises to go through Ishmael, who was not only Abraham's first son, but who was apparently quite fertile, God chooses Isaac and Rebekah, who were barren. If we were writing the story, that this is not how it would go. This is not the way that we would choose. If we had to choose between Isaac's two sons, we'd choose the older. We'd choose Esau. We'd choose him because he's stronger. We'd choose him because he's manlier. We'd choose him because he's more courageous. We'd never choose the one who was not only kind of a wimpy kid who preferred to sit in his mama's lap and stay home, but who was named and known as being a swindling cheater. God is the one who sovereignly chooses who will receive, who will inherit the covenant promises. And his choice is not only final, his choice is not only unassailable, it's also contrary to how fallen man would think and choose and plan. That's the first thing that we need to understand from this story. The second thing that we have to see here is that God's sovereign choice is based entirely on grace. It's all grace. It's not 99.99% grace. It is 100% grace. There is no merit 
to speak of. It is entirely of grace. Nobody deserves it. So when God makes the choice, it is 100% grace. Think about it. If God chose the strongest, their success would be attributed to their strength, at least partially, at least one one one-hundredth of a percent. Had to be because this person was so strong. And they would rob God of his sovereign glory. If God chose the more intelligent, or the more courageous, or the more willing, they too would have something to boast in. And again, God would be robbed of his glory. God's gifts and God's choosing are entirely of unmerited, undeserved grace. And praise the Lord for that because it couldn't work any other way. If it was based on merit, nobody, nobody would qualify. The story also forces us to consider what Paul wrote in Romans chapter 9. If you want to turn in with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 9. This is one of those places where the New Testament explains a, a profoundly deeper significance of an Old Testament passage. Now the reason that, that Romans 9 is even in our Bibles, to, to set the context a little bit, is because Paul needed to address the reality of Israel's unbelief. You'll remember that, that Paul ends Romans chapter 8 by emphatically declaring that God is faithful to his promises and that there's nothing in all of creation that can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look what he says in, in uh, chapter 8 verses uh, 38 and 39. He says, For I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. But that creates a problem. That creates a problem because God had made promises to Israel. And Israel had rejected the gospel. Israel had rejected their Messiah. They had rejected Christ. And so it would seem, it would seem that something can separate us from God's love. That God's plans can be thwarted by human will. By human free will. By, by man's rejection of God. It would seem that way right? And so Romans 9 is really Paul's response to that objection. He starts off Romans chapter 9 by acknowledging in verses 1 to 5 that Israel had indeed rejected Christ, and it was grieving his spirit. It was grieving him that his brethren, according to the flesh, had rejected Christ. But then look at what Romans chapter 9 verses 6 and 7 say. 6 and 7 say this, but it is not as though the word of God has failed. For not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. See, it was the opinion of the majority of Jews that they were saved by their genealogy. They were saved by the fact that they were physical descendants of Abraham, that they had Jewish blood, and nothing could be further from the truth. And I say that as somebody who has a portion of, of Jewish blood within me. Nothing could be further from the truth. As we saw last week, Jesus also ran into this problem. Jesus addressed it. He corrected their thinking in John chapter 8, and Paul's just doing the same thing here. Paul's explained to them that the promises that were made to the offspring of Abraham, referred to as Israel, right? The promises were made, but that the promises were not made to physical Israel. That is, it wasn't made to those who were physical, genealogical descendants of Abraham, but that they were made to spiritual Israel, to those whom God had chosen. And Isaac is the illustration of that. And many of the chosen, of course, would be from physical Israel, but many would also be from the Gentiles, 
So Paul summarizes and restates this deep, deep theological truth in Romans chapter 9, verse 8. Look at verse 8 with me. He says, This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. So we have to remember that Isaac was only one of, of many, many sons. Abraham had many sons. He had Ishmael with Hagar. He had several other sons with Keturah, whom we learned about at the beginning of Genesis chapter 25. So all of these descendants could have made the same claim. Every one of those descendants could have said, well, I, I can trace my lineage right back to Abraham. Hey, I'm, I'm a descendant of Abraham too. Through Isaac? No, 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 through... Ishmael, or through one of Keturah's sons. And so Paul is underscoring the fact that God alone had made the decision of which son the promises of the covenant would be carried through. The promises made to Abraham would only be reckoned through Isaac. And God made that choice in accordance with, his own, with the counsel of his own sovereign will. That's what Paul's saying here. But he foresees one more possible objection because somebody could say, okay, great, so, so God is the one who chose Isaac for the, the, to be the one through whom the promises would go. But, okay, it's understandable that he didn't choose Ishmael because Ishmael was an illegitimate son. And it's understandable that, uh, that God didn't choose the other sons that Abraham had with Keturah because those were much later on with life. They, in life, those weren't with, with Sarah. So they weren't eligible to receive the covenant promises. They were younger, and they were with another woman. And so it's at this point that Paul discusses the second generation after Abraham. He discusses and comments on Jacob and Esau. Let's look at verses 9 to 13. He says, For this is what the promise said. About this time next year I will return, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing either good or bad in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told, the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. So the gist of Paul's argument here is that, is that the choice between Jacob and Esau, the choice as to who would receive the covenant promises, was entirely God's decision to make. It was entirely God's. The decision was made without respect to birth order, and the decision was made without respect to character, whether they were good or bad. The decision was made before they were born, so that you could see that the decision wasn't based on what a good person they were or what a bad person they were, but so that you could clearly see that it was God's choice. Paul says very plainly, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. Who does that refer to? Who, who is him who calls? It's God. It's God. Let's remember that there are two types of callings. There is a, a general calling. There's the gospel calling that goes forth to all men, regardless of nation, regardless of socioeconomic status, regardless of, of anything. The, the, the gospel calling goes out to all men from men. Think about when Jesus said, for many are called, but few are chosen. That's talking about the proclamation of the gospel. It's, it's talking about the call to repent and to place saving faith in Jesus Christ. It is a general call. It goes out to absolutely everybody. It's the Great Commission. But then there's God's sovereign effectual call. God's sovereign effectual call. Think back to Romans chapter 8, verse 30, where Paul says, for those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. So who gets called? Who gets called? It's only those who are predestined. This is God's sovereign effectual call. Only those who are predestined. Who gets justified? 
Everybody who is called. Those who are predestined to be called by God's sovereign effectual call. And I realize that this is really controversial. And I, I realize that there probably isn't a more divisive or, or at least uncomfortable doctrine in all of Christianity than the doctrine of election. And I'll just be straight up front with you guys and admit that I used to absolutely hate that doctrine. And I wasted years of my life trying to squeeze my way around it. And I have to admit that it was just a really difficult pill for me to swallow. I wanted to believe that I played some role in my salvation. And I guess maybe in, in one sense I did. I sinned. I sinned constantly. I sinned repeatedly by choice, thus rendering myself in need of a Savior. As Jonathan Edwards famously said, you contribute nothing to your salvation except the sin that made it necessary, end quote. But as I tried to find a way around, to, to wiggle my way around the doctrine of election, there are a few passages that I came across that I, I, I just couldn't <coughs> squeeze or, or manipulate the text you know, to, to say what I wanted it to say, what I thought it said. I couldn't get around it. I mean, what do you do with the second chapter of 1 Corinthians, which teaches that the natural man, that is the man who isn't saved, the man who doesn't have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit, cannot understand spiritual truths? What do you do with that? I mean, if, if, if that's the case, if, if, if fallen man, if, if natural man cannot understand spiritual truths, and we must understand spiritual truths in order to be saved, then nobody would be saved. Or think about what Jesus said in John chapter 10. He, he's speaking to some, some unbelieving Jews who are skeptical of him and who are questioning him. And he said, you do not believe because you are not among my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Let me say that first part again. You do not believe because you are not among my sheep. He doesn't say you're not among my sheep because you don't believe. He says, you don't believe because you're not among my sheep. There's no way around the way that the doctrine of election is implied in that verse without absolutely abusing God's word. And the same can be said for the, the doctrine of God's sovereign effectual calling. It's clearly implied in that verse. I mean, what do you do? What do you do when you have some preconceived notion and the Bible clearly confronts it. What do you do? Do you try to change what God's Word says? Do you try to wiggle your way around it hermeneutically? Or do you yield yourself to it? Think about it like putting a puzzle together. When you're putting a puzzle together, let's say you're on the corner piece and you, you come up with a piece that has a, you know, a big round thing off the side. Well, it's the right color. I think that it should go here, but it doesn't fit. So what do you do? You don't cut off the end so that you can make it fit. You find someplace else for it, and you find the right piece for that part. Now, if you're like me, or if you're like I was, and you're having trouble with the doctrine of election, first of all, let me say that I understand the difficulties and I also understand that this is a secondary issue. This is not a salvation issue in the sense that somebody can not have salvation if they don't believe in the doctrine of election. It's not like that. But if, if you're like I was, your objection is probably, if you boil it down, it's probably, that doesn't seem fair. And Paul saw that objection coming, so he continues in verses 14 to 16. He says, what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? In other words, shall we say that God is just unfair? <coughs> By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then, it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. So he's addressing the, the objection that election just seems so unfair. Let's talk about that for a minute. Is, is election unfair? It's only unfair 
if we deserve to be elected. It's only unfair if there's something in us that demands that God choose us. And Scripture makes it clear there isn't. In fact, if we're talking about fairness, if if we're talking about the justice of God, justice demands that we would spend eternity in torment in hell because of our sin. Because justice does demand that God's wrath be fully poured out, that God's wrath be fully unleashed against sin. And so Christ was sent to redeem, to stand in the place of His people, of the elect. And He bore our sin, and He bore God's wrath in our place, while His perfect righteousness was imputed to all who would repent and believe. So maybe your question If you you can't argue that God isn't fair, maybe what you should argue is, well, why doesn't he just save everybody? There's a question for the ages. But before you ask that question, let me ask you to answer a different question. Why does he save anyone? We've already established he doesn't need anybody. So why does he save anyone? We don't know. We don't know. Scripture doesn't tell us. Scripture never reveals an answer to that for us. You remember Deuteronomy 29, 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God. What we do know is that whatever his reason for saving anyone might be, it's not because there's something good within us that demands it. It's not because there's something that he needs in us or from us. There's nothing within us that dictates or demands that God show us mercy. It's undeserved. Mercy is always undeserved. By definition, you can't earn mercy. You can't earn grace. The truth is, friends, if if salvation were contingent upon our decision, our goodness, nobody would be saved. Nobody. If it were up to us to turn to God and to accept it, everyone would go to hell. Romans chapter 3 establishes none is righteous. No, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. Jesus says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. And he goes on to say this. He says, everyone, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Not most, not some, not a few, all. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me, he says. That's from John chapter 6, verses 44 and 45. Friends, we are born spiritually dead. And dead people don't respond to offers to live. If God did not quicken us, if God did not regenerate us by the power of His Spirit, nobody would be saved. Nobody, not even one. And were it not for grace, we would not want it any other way. The greatest arguments... The most persuasive arguments in the world can't do anything to convince somebody who's in in unbelief, who is dead in their sin. If you want to see a miracle, you you see these people on the internet who who are supposedly doing miracles. You want to see a miracle? Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel because when somebody believes, it is literally a miracle. It is God intervening, opening that person's eyes to see the glory of Christ and to believe. Now, you might remain unconvinced of the doctrine of election, and that's, that's okay, but, but I'll say this much. When you come to terms with it, when you come to terms with it, it is the most blessed of doctrines. It is the most blessed of doctrines. That's that's when you really start to understand that salvation is entirely, entirely of grace. Why are you saved? Think about that for a minute. Why why do you believe, but you've got neighbors who don't? Is it because you're smarter? You've got something to boast in. Is it because you're more willing to be obedient? You've got something to boast in. Is it because there's something special about you? Then you've got something to boast in. It is entirely, entirely of grace. It is grace alone. 
If it had anything to do with you, you would have something to boast in. But Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 makes it clear. There, there's no room for anybody to boast. And one of the reasons that it's the most blessed of, of doctrines, in my opinion, is that it is so humbling. It just has a way of stripping away your last bit of pride to understand that God saved us despite ourselves. We can all boast in one thing and one thing only, his goodness and his grace. Let's finish looking at what Paul was writing to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 30 and 31. Paul says this, And because of him you are in Christ Jesus. Because of who? Because of you? Because of him. It is because of him you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. There is nothing in us that's good, friends. Not even faith. Not, not, not even faith. Even faith is a gift from God so that God alone receives all the glory for our salvation. So the first benefit of, of, of coming to terms with this blessed doctrine is that it humbles us before the Lord. And that's a good place to be. The second benefit of coming to terms with this doctrine is that it gives us the comfort and the assurance that our salvation is secure. If you're saved, you, you know that God chose from eternity to save you. And the work of salvation is entirely His. Your salvation doesn't rest on your fragile ability to hold on to God. It rests on God's sovereign promise to hold on to you and to finish the work that He has begun in you because He has purposed from eternity to do it. So the first benefit is that it's humbling in the most beautiful way. The second benefit is that it gives us a comfort and assurance that our salvation is secure. The third benefit, and we'll just end with this, the third thing is that the doctrine of election encourages evangelism. The doctrine of election encourages evangelism. Now you might say, wait a minute. I've seen some Calvinists who aren't very humble and who don't really evangelize because they've got the idea that God, you know, if God has decided from eternity that, you know, this person's going to be saved and this isn't, then there's no point in going out and evangelizing. And that is heretical. That is absolutely sinful. And that's disobedient to the Great Commission. If that's what the doctrine of election does to somebody, they don't understand it. No, understanding the doctrine of election should encourage evangelism because the Bible explicitly tells us that the preaching of the gospel is the means by which God has ordained in His sovereign wisdom to call the elect to faith. So our, our job isn't to have gimmicks. Our job isn't to try to come up with all kinds of creative ways to convince somebody to believe. No, our job is to preach the gospel. To preach the gospel, period. Knowing that what Jesus, is, what Jesus said is true, that His sheep know His voice. That when you preach the gospel, His sheep hear His voice and they follow Him. The only way to identify the elect is to preach the gospel and to see how a person responds to it. And so with that said, may we examine our lives and see true repentance and faith. And may we see God's work being done within us as we hunger for more of his word, as we humble ourselves before him, as we strive for obedience unto him, remembering that just like we learned from the story of Jacob and Esau, God chooses the meek and the lowly and the unlikely so that when his plans and promises are fulfilled, he alone gets all the glory. You know, sometimes you look at the world and you think, man, this place is just going to hell in a handbasket. 
this place is so wicked and, and, and getting more and more wicked. We think that we've reached the depths. Nope, next week something else happens and we go even further away from God. And when you see that, it is so easy to feel despair or to, to, to feel hopeless. But when you're tempted to feel that way, that's when you need to remember that God promises that he's causing all things to work together for his people's growth in Christ's likeness and for his glory. And we can rest assured with 100% confidence that nothing, nothing can thwart God's plans or to prevent his promises from being fulfilled. Let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your word. And we thank you for the way it does your work in us, for the way it humbles us, for the way it grows our faith, for the way it causes us to be hungry to glorify Christ. And so, Father, we thank you for who you are and we thank you for your word. And we confess to you, Father, that there is nothing good within us. We confess to you in the silence of our hearts that we are sinners. That if it were up to us, we never would have yielded to you. We never would have submitted to you. And so we thank you, Father, that in your sovereign, eternal plans, you reveal the riches of your mercy. Lord, help us to live lives that reflect your goodness, your righteousness, and your mercy. Humble us to bring forth the gospel message and to preach boldly, knowing that the results are in your hands. Lord, help us glorify Christ in all that we do. It's in his name we pray. Amen. If you want to see more videos like this, hit the subscribe button. Thank you for watching.